Okay, hi, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, James and everybody else at Future Architecture Platform for inviting me. I'm it's the first time I'm here. I think it's uh, I've, I've been following from from outside this uh, all the work of the organization. I think it's amazing to see all these people and all this energy and creativity. Uh, and also just to follow up on, that wasn't really planned, but to follow up on James. Um, yeah, I can, my talk is not a lot at all about Brexit and about Europe and this, but I'm gonna just mention that I uh, came 14 years ago from Canada with this, and with a Polish passport in my pocket, with a, this kind of dream of living in Europe. And now I'm probably the only one who moved back to the UK in 2017, just after Brexit was voted. So now I'm in the opposite position of James, so living in the UK with a European passport. Uh, so yeah, it's an interesting position, let's say it this way, to be in. Um, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna present um, uh, my work on biennials and triennials, a little bit more from a, let's say, historical and theoretical perspective. Uh, and I will be followed by um, uh, Marina and Mariana, which are going to present their work as curators. So I think it's mostly framing uh, the work of, of people working with uh, biennials and triennials. I'm not so sure what Thomas will talk about, but uh, I hope that it gives a, a frame for um, for a discussion uh, after, and also thinking about um, what these institutions uh, produce and what is their role in uh, architecture culture today. Okay, so, oh yeah, uh, I think it's better like this because, I, yeah. So at an event in Paris some months ago, the chief curator of the 2019 Lisbon Architecture Triennale Economy of Means, uh, architect Eric Lapierre, presented the concept behind his Triennale. Following his presentation, a courageous young man in the audience raised the following question. What is the relationship between the five exhibition forming Economy of Means and the specific context of Lisbon? Of course, it created a bit of debate and polemic. So critical, the young man was addressing what, according to him, was a lack of consideration for the current politics of the city. The question raised in this uh, Paris uh, evening opens a much bigger one. What is the role and the agency of architecture biennials and triennials in regards to their host city? In other words, how are these institutions, and a few of them are here today, promoting forms of curatorship that go beyond the space of the gallery and have a critical, transformative, and performative impact on urban spaces? Or let me rephrase the question, can architecture biennials and triennials go beyond the space of the gallery and have a transformative impact on urban spaces? Architecture biennials and triennials are a specific form of curatorial practice. And if the label sometimes appears overrated these days, it is nonetheless corresponding to a certain type of exhibitions. I have been interested in this format of architecture biennials and triennials for over a decade now. First, I wrote about the history of the, and the prehistory of the Venice Architecture Biennale, mother of all the annuals. And uh, I looked at the small, so doing that, I looked at the small revolution that happened in Italy at the outset of the 1980s and how it resulted in the architecture being pulled in the system of the Biennale that was already existing for a while. Uh, with my most recent book that you see here, Conversations on the Geography of Itinerant Display, I address these questions with a more contemporary uh, frame. Today, architecture biennials and triennials act as new disciplinary agents in architecture. As we know, in the 40 years after the creation of the Architecture Biennale in Venice, the field of architecture has seen a remarkable change in the role played by practices of display. So the book uh, contains six interviews with um, curators of architecture or design, biennials and triennials, mostly 
uh, curators who, of exhibition between, let's say, 2016 and 2019. And uh, the interviews were uh, along, let's say, different axes. Uh, one was the institutional nature of the biennials and triennials, so the role of these institutions in respect to other institutions and the possible collaboration between museum and more uh, periodic events. The second one was the public and geographic nature of the biennial, so this is what I'm expanding on today, so the relation between these institutions and the cities. And the third one was the disciplinary nature of the Biennale and Triennale, what is uh, their contribution to uh, the knowledge production in and around architecture, and even, I would say, the production of architecture. So what are we producing with these exhibitions? Um, in 2019, there was an incredible sort of um, uh, overlapping of a lot of these uh, events, uh, kind of some alignment of stars, we could say. So Shenzhen, Sao Paulo, Lisbon, Oslo, Tallinn, Chicago, Seoul, Orleans, Sharjah, all these happen in the fall of 2019. So cities around the globe using the label biennial or triennial to increase their cultural capital. So I'm not sure how many of you have been to all of these biennials and triennials. Probably no one, not even me. So impossible, maybe people. No, no. <laughs> no, well, that's not true, people, that's not true. <laughs> Happening at regular intervals, these large-scale exhibitions use architecture, design, and the urban environment more broadly to tackle societal topic ranging from sustainability to our sense of belonging and from robotization to the power of form. They follow and record economic crisis, city crisis, migration crisis, and they speak of a phenomena closely linked to the world situation rather than just architecture per se. So one of the things that I did in the book and also working with students in Oslo a few years ago was to trace a sort of timeline of, of architecture biennials and triennials with that was um, put in shape by uh, Joao Doria, who was the graphic designer of the book. Um, so something uh, yeah, as simple hadn't been done before. Um, now to go back a little bit on the history, uh, the Prima Mostra Internazionale di Architettura, uh, sorry, the Prima Mostra Internazionale d'Arte della Città di Venezia, mother of all the biennials and triennial, came to life, as I'm sure you all know, in 1895. And it's quite interesting, coming back to uh, the reading by James, that it was actually formalizing uh, informal gathering happening in the Café Florian uh, in Piazza San Marco. So um, exactly what uh, he was talking about. So one of the reasons for starting uh, the Biennale, uh, this, apart from the creation of a national uh, Italian art, because it was obviously the beginning of Italy as a country, was to increase tourism, or believe it or not, at the time, Ven Venice needed more tourists. Um, then in 1968, the Venice Biennale, like many other institutions, faced a crisis uh, that resulted in activist occupation of the exhibition, but also sparked off a series of protests, which used the urban space as a stage for political agency. Uh, following the uprisings of 1968, wi which witnessed, uh, amongst other disturbances, the call for uh, renewing exhibition practices and the system of value on which they were founded, a series of initiative and exp experiment were undertook uh, in Venice and beyond. So here the image you see is on the, um, on the Zatere, right? So that, that today. Uh, so in Venice and beyond, bringing the activities of the Biennale as far as possible, even on the terra ferma, so beyond Venice, and really trying to get closer to the resident of Venice and the Veneto. During the so-called laboratory years, so here you see an image of the Venice Biennale in 1976, so the laboratory years were between 74 and 79, under the directorship of Vittorio Gregotti, a series of architecture exhibitions challenged the boundaries between art and architecture exhibition. Um, 
so what I'm going to try to do now is to propose three lenses for analyzing this uh, possible or impossible agency of architecture biennials and triennials, how they can really intervene in cities, uh, so on also on virtual or tangible uh, civic spaces. So the three frames are, or the three uh, modes of, of, of action in a way, are restore, reshape, and reframe. Um, so the first one, restore. Uh, architecture and design biennials and triennial, triennials often directly contribute to the reappropriation of urban spaces. They restore meaning, bringing back, meaning bringing back, re-establishing previous rights, practices, or situation. The return to uh, previous or uh, sometimes uh, speculative positions. Uh, capitalizing on a phenomenon uh, akin to the so-called Bilbao effect, they push city marketing by gathering, by getting architectural circuit to a cities, and of course Venice is the most famous uh, example in an attempt to do something for local businesses. So a st stunning and highly uh, powerful proto-industrial uh, space like the Arsenale in Venice was at the beginning of the 12th century uh, the really the heart of, the, of Venice's naval industry, and you see it very clearly on this painting here. So, uh, as I'm sure some of you know, this building was mentioned in Dante's Inferno, and it was until, but it was until the Industrial Revolution, the largest manufacturing complex in Europe. Yet, is it, if it was the uh, even at, at its highest point of activity, the Arsenale employed more than 15 uh, men but its interior spaces were never uh, publicly accessible. So it's really the Biennale who uh, kind of allowed to open these spaces to the eyes of the, both the Venetian and also the public. So the Biennale is now the occasion to put this magnificent space on display every year, not just to the eyes of the Venetian public, but also the international visitors. And the contact between the exhibition and the, Bien the Biennale and the architecture of the lagoon goes far beyond the arsenale. And um, you see examples here. And it gr as it grows bigger and bigger every year, the event uses a plethora of disused spaces in palazzi, churches around Venice, literally interweaving the city with uh, the exhibition. But before the arsenale, the Venice Biennale already had occupied disused and contested spaces in the city. The Magazzini del Sale, for example, um, that you see here, where in 1976 the container for a seminal exhibition called Europa America Architetture Urbane uh, Alternative Suburbane. And you see an image um, here of the, of the building when, um, so this, this building was really a monument to the economic power of the trading. In Venice it was the container for the, the salt, uh, uh, obviously, and the Magazzini del Sale were the object of a desperate preservation battle at the time when it was recuperated by the Biennale. So fo following the incredible decision of the city council on the 7th of December 1973, it was voted by 46 uh, votes uh, against zero to knock down the building and build a swimming pool uh, inside hollowing out the inside and leaving only the perimeter uh, walls intact. Um, but the uh, Biennale kind of saved this uh, building with uh, the exhibition, in fact. Another Venetian building that, uh, so this is, sorry, the Magazzini del Sale with uh, the exhibition inside and the plan here, so you see these kind of long, narrow uh, spaces. Huh? Yeah. So another space, of course, that I'm sure you all know as well, uh, that was um, uh, in a way saved by the Biennale in the late 70s was uh, the Mulino Stucchi. So in 1975, Gregotti organized an exhibition called A Proposito del Mulino Stucchi, and the idea was even to organize the exhibition inside the Mulino Stucchi, but that wasn't... Um, allowed by the, the company who owned the building. So it was mainly artists, but also a few architects like uh, Seid and Heyduk. Heyduk who uh, produced a beautiful project called Cemetery for the Ashes of Thought. Um, so the, these projects were really trying to propose um, scenarios, uh, utopian scenarios for the, um, 
for the Mulino Stucchi. Um, so the Arsenale, the Magazzini del Sale, and the Mulino Stucchi were all saved, but while the, while the two first are now an uh, Im important part of Venice's cultural economy, the Mulino Stucchi, as you know, is now a hotel uh, Hilton. So another, another fate in a way. And here another example of a, a way in which exhibition kind of restore building in the city uh, is the, the case of the Li Li Lisbon Triennale headquarters. Uh, as Andre Tavares uh, mentioned in the interview uh, that is included in the, in the book, and I'm going to quote Andre, uh, it was agreed that the Triennale, the Lisbon Triennale, could occupy a municipal building, a 2,000 square meters former high school that was falling apart, if they could secure its maintenance and ultimately the renovation of the building. That meant building a new roof, repairing the water leaks, renovating the facade, etc. It was a great move because it gave the institution a new mission. Instead of aiming for a three years program and spending two years operating in slow motion, the institution also started to work on the renovation of the palace and to become more solid. So those are all examples of uh, how the, the exhibition restore uh, spaces in the city. Now the second, um, the second mode of action is uh, to reshape. Uh, Biennale and Triennale expand in the urban territory, reshaping the network of cultural spaces and institutions. And here is uh, maps of um, architecture uh, biennials and triennial. I'm sure you can recognize uh, where they are. And um, so you see that the map created by these events uh, that really kind of spread out in the city create in a way new local geographies, uh, either temporary or more permanent ones. So connections between institutions. The Chicago Biennial, created in 2015, is an example in which politicians were strongly engaged in cultural policies. The event grew or gave new life to the Chicago Cultural Center and uh, that a landmark building created also at the end of the 19th century and located in the center of the city's loop. Originally, the Central Library, it was the Central Library and the space was converted to an art center in uh, the late 70s. So as Sarah Herda uh, mentioned also in the interview, the interview with Sarah Herda was a lot about this kind of uh, embeddedness in the city of Chicago and how, of course, this is an example of, a, of an exhibition that really starts from uh, the city and, and, and really worked with a municipal uh, power. So Sarah Herda uh, says, and I'm quoting, uh, from the very beginning, we had the idea that the city was the site and that the cultural center was the hub and the main node in a network, but that we really wanted to embed our exhibition in the city. Another example in Chicago, a beautiful building that was kind of um, uh, also reused by, uh, by the, the Biennale is the, the Stony Island Art Bank a former bank that became an hybrid uh, gallery, media, uh, archive, and library and community uh, center. So the Chicago Biennial becomes a city-making project uh, which activates notion of civic and social responsibility of the architect and becomes social, a social and political instrument. In brief, uh, the word Biennale, the Italian for every other year, uh, if, the, if the word Biennale is amongst the most overpriced term in early 21st century, it is commonly used to describe a large-scale international contemporary exhibition and happening. The word has also become a label, almost a brand, that is used and abused by cities around the globe in an attempt to increase their cultural capital. And if the concept was originally associated with uh, its potential, for diplomatic and international relation as well as urban regeneration, it's now too often seen as nothing more than an overblown system of a spectacular event uh, culture. And the result of some, some of the spacious transformation of the world in an age of uh, global capitalism. So um, for in the case of the Lisbon Triennale, uh, there was different strategies. So here you see 
the example of the 2013 uh, Biennale curated by uh, Beatrice Galilei, which really worked on sort of activating uh, social spaces in the city. And one uh, in 2016, uh, Andre Tavares uh, took the curatorship of the exhibition. Uh, they really wanted to kind of reconcile the conflict between the local and the global. Uh, and uh, so Tavares uh, said our strategy was completely different from the previous uh, editions. It was the Fortree Annales, so the institution already had a name in the city, and we managed to bring together the Gulbakian Foundation, the Centro Cultural Belen, and its Garage M. Sul, and the, e the, um, the EDP Foundation, uh, which in the meanwhile became the MAT. So we decided to spread the exhibition between those more conventional exhibition venue, rather than, than to have it just in one uh, location. And of course, it was an effective solution for operating within a limited budget, because these institutions already had their functional infrastructures and expertise. So Tavares concludes saying, for us it was clear that it was a chance to bring to Lisbon an international network of people and discourses that are not usually physically present in the city. So really this idea of reshaping in a way the geography of the city through um, the exhibition. And finally, uh, the, last, uh, the last mode of operation, reframe. Often Biennale and Triennale reframe the city through spectacularization. Again, the paradigmatic example, and it seems like all the paradigmatic examples are in Venice in the late 70s, uh, of this type of operation can be found in the Venice Biennale in 1979. Uh, in its capacity of director of the Biennale, and I'm sure you all know the story, uh, of, in his capacity of new director of the Biennale, Paolo Portoghesi commissioned Aldo Rossi to build a small theater, floating theater, that became an, a highly performative wood and steel theater, acting as both an experiment and a signal, marking the beginning of an era moving towards architecture as event. And now I'm sure you all know the story of how the theater really kind of uh, was performative in framing uh, new views of the city and uh, also uh, proposing in a way al alteration of the, of the architecture of the city that was not possible because of the nature of, of Venice. Sometimes Biennale and Triennale through performative intervention can be real catalyst for the city's renewal. And the example that was also uh, very much talked about was the case of Manifesta 12 in Palermo which was the occasion of a very serious research on the city. So it was not only sort of coming to a city and exhibiting, but also really doing a uh, preparatory, an, an extensive preparatory work on the, the city. Um, the, project was, uh, the project was the city itself. And Ippolito Pestellini, who curated, uh, or who was the uh, artistic director of Manifesto 12, explained this particularly successful imbrication between the city and the exhibition. And again, quote from the interview, he said, it was not because we had a number of interventions in the city, but because the city was really the script for the whole manifesto, and more specifically, what the city represents today in the context of global phenomena. It was difficult in Palermo to really register where the exhibition St stopped and where the city started, or the other way around. And here you see the work of um, the work of Rotor as well, who um, invested a, a building, an existing or a sort of ruin or modern ruin of a building. So, but Manifesto, of course, as you know, is always this kind of special relationship. Uh, has always this special relationship with the. Um, the, admin, the local administration, and there was even an edition uh, here in uh, Ljubljana. Uh, finally, a last example, another beautiful case of what I would call reframing, uh, is the work, and uh, Marina might expand on this because it was the work of her uh, team actually in Oslo. So the beautiful case of reframing in the uh, work of artist Jonas Stahl's conception and design of the New World Embassy a stateless embassy developed for the Kurdish community of the autonomous region of Rojava, northern Syria, for the 2016 Oslo Architecture Triennale after belonging. The embassy proposed a space in which to discuss the ideal of a stateless democracy 
It brought together different groups who were trying not to limit their democratic system and communities to the boundaries of the nation state. So question of identity, autonomy, diplomacy, and political representation were all tackled by this uh, project and all connected to the struggle and idea developed by the autonomous region of Rojava in the northern uh, Syria. So by reframing, and what was obviously particular from this project was the place in which it's, uh, it was sitting, which is in the city hall, uh, beautiful and highly symbolic civic space of the Oslo Radhuset or city hall. So it was also reframing the space of the Kurdish community within the Norwegian society uh, and proposing a poetic superimposition of the space of discourses, power and disciplines. And here you see also how it worked around a uh, discussion, around a table. So maybe also uh, I would like to make, of course, the connection with uh, what Marina said about, you know, uh, being at the table or um, bringing, or maybe here it's the case of the architect bringing other people uh, at the table. So just to conclude or to finish, uh, I wanted to uh, mention two of the projects that uh, are here present today. Uh, this is not. This is actually ov obviously the, the Belgian pavilion of uh, Trom Nouvelle, but uh, I took this image from the Mies uh, TV uh, project, um, and there was a, there was an interesting. So I, I got lost a little bit on on the website of this of this project. Huh? they were yeah, okay, Trom Nouvelle, but Mies Mies TV. That's the project is here, right? So I got a bit lost on this uh, website, and interestingly, I found a video that was done at the Venice Biennale at the last edition, where they basically went around and asked people, um, you know, what do you think the Venice Biennale is for, and what is it, how is it useful in the architecture discipline? And interestingly, no one said to exhibit or to see exhibition or to see, uh, you know, representation of architecture. They all talked about triggering debate meeting, informality of meeting between people, and meeting place. So I think this, this is just um, probably an idea also on how these events can connect to, uh, to the space of, of a city. So I thought this, this image was also illustrating that beautifully. And then the other project I want to mention, and unfor unfortunately I missed the presentation yesterday, but I had a long conversation with Davide just before this, uh, and I know uh, the project very well. I think it's, a, it's an amazing um, case of not only an alternative way of, of curating and exhibiting, but also an alternative way of connecting uh, with, uh, with, the, with the city. So the project of the, uh, you will have recognized it, the Unfolding Pavilion. This is the edition of uh, 2018. Uh, and uh, so you all know all about it because you heard yesterday, but I think they, and I just made the exercise of uh, trying to see how they restore, uh, uh, reframe and reshape. So I think they, obviously they restore because they literally restore uh, an apartment. So uh, Davide was telling me a little bit about how they um, restore the apartment uh, at the Judeca uh, uh, for the last edition. So, of course, it's a restoration of a building. At the same time, it's a reframing because it's really a sort of bottom-up uh, curating practice that is outside of the system of the Biennale that wants to stay outside. So it's a kind of love-hate relationship with the institution, uh, a bottom-up practice that invites, they invite themselves to the table. In a way, they're not invited, but they they invite themselves and they create an exhibition in a space that is not for exhibition. And it also reshape uh, the geography of the Biennale and the geography of, of Venice by bringing people to other places in the city. Like, so last year I remember that it was quite uh, extraordinary how they managed to pull quite a lot of people to the, to the Judeca and we know how it's uh, difficult in the time of the, of the vernissage. So, in conclusion, uh, I would like to just come back to the question I raised at the beginning of this talk. If the term biennial, tri triennial, biennale, triennale are not totally overrated, uh, they do, I believe, uh, have an intrinsic connection with the territory and the local power in which uh, they sit. Uh, and they, um, 
uh, create in this way, uh, they differ from other more conventional uh, forms of display. And now the question is, uh, what exactly uh, do they produce? Uh, and also, what do they produce for the territory in which they, they sit? Thank you very much. <laughs>